All right. Give me a second, though, for the live stream. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> check check double check having technical difficulties hopefully it will work need me to do a sound check <laughs> no just the i mean you can but it's the encoder box i think maybe it's shy it works all day long until you all show up and then it stops. Does anybody else see that Patrick's in on the on this twice? Yeah, that's the only way that my sound works for the recording. Ah. Huh. Give me a minute here. I'm going to try one other thing. And if not, we're just going to have to do it without the live stream and we'll have the up uploading recorded tomorrow. Yeah, I think we're going to just have to go uh, and I'll upload the recording as soon as possible. Okay. So I guess we should just uh, start then. So Patrick, I'll just go. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, we have... Um, on the call, myself, Jr. Councilor Anton Moody, Councilor Kelly Swearingen, Councilor Craig Schulte, Councilor Tim Kennedy, and then we also have City Attorney Chris Hood, City Administrator Mike Roth, and City Communication Director Patrick Knight, and Kim Dunsmore, who is the Finance Director for the City. There is our roll call. So then um, we will move on to open forum. So does anybody have any open forum items for the for the meeting? Okay, hearing none, then we will close the open forum and we will move on to the consent agenda. So the consent agenda has four items on it, the typical three with a um, additional, which is golf seasonal hires. There are two hires for the, um, for the the golf course that they would like. Um, unless someone would like to pull something for discussion, um, well, and before I before I, I ask for a motion, Mike, should we should we uh, add to the agenda that request for downtown sidewalk use? If you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd appreciate that, and I know they would as well. Yes, 
So you, there was an email that was sent out this afternoon um, with an update on that. Uh, so I would, I would uh, request that we add that to the agenda, and then, um, and then with that modification, unless somebody else wants to, um, wants to pull something else for further discussion, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Anybody? Just a question, Jay. You know, what are are we dealing with that uh, closing of the meeting for that legal issue to also? Yes, we are. Yep. Is is that part of the agenda? It's on the agenda. It's on the updated agenda. It's on the published agenda. I see. Okay, but I would make a motion then that we uh, approve the consent agenda. The consent okay. There's a motion. Is there a second? Anybody? Well, I'll second it then. Um, so motion and a second. Any further discussion on that motion? Roll call vote going from top to bottom. Uh, Anton, your, your vote? Uh, aye. Kelly, your vote? Aye. Craig, your vote? <laughs> Got the mute. Yeah. Tim, your vote? Aye. And I am an aye as well. So the consent agenda is uh, passed as amended. Okay, so we're just going to move right along. We're going to go to the Highway 61 draft change order number two, sanitary lining. So um, I'm going to probably hand this one over pretty early here. Um, but the understanding is that uh, that this this change order for a um, a change in the sanitary lining um, comes to a total savings that is just under four hundred thousand dollars, three hundred ninety three five eighteen and twenty cents. Um, now, my understanding is that KGM has not yet completely signed off on this change order, so that's something that's still in um, that's still in flux, but for a better update of that, I'll turn it over to Mike and he can give us a little bit more information on on this and the logistics that go into what we're asking for for a change order. Thanks, Jay. So a little backstory, just to remind people, this is one of the items that when we opened the bids, we were disappointed in the price point. Uh, we thought it was quite a bit higher than the engineer's estimate. And we had a lot of ideas as to how to address that. The strategy that we pursued was to work through our engineers and MinDOT and the contractor to try and find a less costly option to make the repairs. The, the path that was taken was for MinDOT to ask KGM to do what's called value engineering, which means KGM actually prepares the proposal for the work to be done. Um, we provided them with some up-to-date information about the condition of the sewer, and then KGM went to work putting together these numbers and provided them to MnDOT. So although KGM hasn't signed off on the form of the change order, the, the concept and the price is all originated from KGM. When MnDOT works through their contractor to do value engineering, one of the features of that is that any savings that the contractor can come up with in the value engineering proposal are shared equally between MnDOT and the contractor. So you'll see that although the price of this work is $393,000 less because it's a value engineering proposal, half of that is paid back to KGM on a lump sum. So our actual savings is $196,759, still a substantial amount. Our engineers have been involved in this process. Our staff people have been involved in this process. Um, I, I would say that this is not our first choice of how we'd wanna do this work. Um, we talked about lining the pipes before we did the design work with our engineers. And based on the original engineer's estimate for the cost of replacing them, we preferred to just dig them up and replace them. But given the fact that that's $200,000 more expensive now, 
we're, we're seriously willing or considering uh, this option instead and, and are offering it for your consideration as well. So it wouldn't be our preference, but for $200,000, our engineers approve it, our staff's willing to accept it. What? I had a, had a question about what, uh, what the lifespan of this uh, option is compared to uh, the, new, the new pipe. I don't know that we know the answer to that question. This um, pipelining cast in place, they actually are just curing a plastic pipe inside of the existing pipe. Um, it, it should last a very long time, but this hasn't been something that's been done for a hundred years, like ductile iron or, or clay that what's in there now. So we don't have a proven lifespan to, to look back on. Uh, we expect this to be many, many decades of service. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is that does that solve your question, Tim? Or is yeah, that the, the only other question I had is just the 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 practice. It sounds like it's a it's a standard practice of half of the uh, savings going to the contractor under state contracts. Uh, seems like a lot of money. The contractor is getting a lot of money, where we're we're save, we're trying to save money and. I'm not sure what the contractor is, is doing for their, their 50% uh, share of that uh, savings. Seems, seems like it's, it's an awful lot. Yeah, and yeah, we've, we've had numerous conversations about the, uh, the ins and outs of the contract and how it, it does, that definitely does not seem to favor uh, the municipality in a lot of the situations. Um, yeah. So no taken on that, Tim, definitely. Um, Kelly, did you have a comment on that as well? I had the same question as Tim, basically, about the life of, of pipes and if we made this change. OK. Did you feel like that was, that was a sufficient enough answer for, for your concern on that? Yeah. Yeah. So is there any further discussion on this? I mean, I, I understand what they're doing. I mean, I understand, you know, there's, there's about, what, 15 pages of this in our packet that talks, breaks down the different, um, the different options and the expense of each and, um, and the change order, you know, language. Um, I feel like I understand what they're, what they're going to do and where they're going to do it. Um, the concerns that I had were concerns about safety of doing this, um, such as like the safety against rupture, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because that seems to be a big problem that we end up having with our, our water mains and sometimes our sewer mains when they aren't successfully connected or the ground moves around where the connections are. Um, but uh, I did some research on this process and it seems like the, it's, you know, it's, it's very well accepted as a, um, as a method for, for fixing these pipes. And in some ways it's actually more secure because it are, has the existing pipe around to protect it. Um, so I feel pretty comfortable with the option is what I'm, is what I'm getting down to with that. Um, so does anyone else have any, any thoughts or questions or concerns on this? on this change order? Is this, just to be clear, this is the one where the um, difference from like six inch to eight inch was, the, the cost difference was so different. We were wondering why they didn't just go to the, this is the solution for that one where that number came back so much bigger. Mm, I don't think that's this. I'll, I wouldn't ca categorize it that way, but I know that it has occasionally been categorized that way in your conversations. The, the fact that this is six inch pipe is not really related to the price difference. The price difference has everything to do with the location that this pipe is and the difficulty of doing the rest of the project while this work is being done in this location. They had a lot of other explanations. None of them were particularly satisfactory, but there's, there's not really a strategy that we can 
get to a satisfactory answer and a satisfactory price. So this is the one we've selected. <laughs> well, was this something they knew? Was this something they knew? The engineers knew prior to the bidding of this project. I'm not sure what you're asking, Craig. Well, I'm asking. We're basically paying them to not do the work. We're saving fifty percent. So, in the long run, is it money well spent or money well saved? You get my point. Um, well, if you're asking the, is it worth saving the two hundred thousand to do less of the project? Uh, I'm not sure that we have a good answer for that. I think that's a that's the question that's in front of you right now. If you're yeah. asking. Did the engineers know that it would be cheaper to line it before we did the project? And the answer is no, they certainly didn't. They probably would have guessed the lining would have been quite a bit more expensive than digging it up. We expected quite a few savings associated with the fact that the road was being reconstructed anyway. Uh, but the engineer's estimate was clearly not accurate. Yeah. So is that kind of bringing back onto the table then? Craig, the question about whether constricting the project and saving that two hundred thousand. Well, I understand we're saving a hundred. We're saving two hundred thousand dollars. I understand that, but we're also the the scale of the work is four hundred thousand. Am I not? Am I right on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's why there's a lot of questions about. Okay, is is it worth just doing what we're doing? Is it the longevity? Um, I think that's a good sure. question, Craig. Do we I have mean, do we have a good comparison against um, uh, to say what you know what we're getting, what we're losing, you know, versus out of each of these options? I mean, because the the uh, the stuff that exists in the in the packet is it doesn't have any maps. It basically just has has all the language about the the different pipes and the different techniques and um, and how things are are going. Are going to go with the change order um so that's yeah that's my question is do we have a good way of seeing seeing what we're not going to get if we cut the if we cut the four hundred thousand dollars out of the project at a two hundred thousand dollar savings for the city there, there isn't anything that we're not going to get i mean we're not going to get new pipes in the ground um but we're going to get new pipes in the ground, right? And through a different method, we're just not replacing the existing ones. Instead, we're lining them. But the same scope of work is being done. the The sewer line from Eighth Avenue West to Third Avenue West is in poor condition. The manholes are in poor condition. Some of the service lines are in poor condition. And when the project's done, they'll be in good condition. But that's if if we were to stick with what the original plan was, we would be getting new pipes in the ground, not just line pipes. Right. That's right. I think, yeah. So, so do we know, do we know what the total cost of the putting new pipes is compared to the savings of the 400,000? Yep. That's uh that was part of the original bid. We have and to, my question goes back to my original, my thought comes back to my original question is that, we really don't know what we're getting in terms of longevity with the uh, repl replacement option or the, the lining of the existing pipes. But we have a pretty good idea what we what we, we would be getting if we replaced the pipes entirely. And the question is, is the unknown of the lining of the pipes worth the savings over the uh, cost of installing all new pipes and having a pretty good idea of the longevity of the uh of that that uh, fix right so you're saying is it worth is it worth us putting the extra money down right now to get brand new pipes because the length that they'll last is going to save us money in the long run is that yeah it's a two hundred thousand dollar difference in our part there might be a four hundred thousand dollar savings but we only see two hundred thousand so it's only a two hundred thousand dollar um reduction in cost for us. And so Tim, to try and answer some of your question, the original cost of this work that's removed from the project and replaced with the lining was $687,000. So 
So 687,000 was removed and then added back in was $490,000. Of that 490, 196.7 is the value engineering lump sum payment. So it's more like, um, you know, $300,000 is what the cost of lining the pipes is versus 687 is what the cost of replacing them was. Remember, 687 is what the bid price is for replacing them. What we expected it to be was more like $250,000. Right. So, it, you know, what is the value of replacing them? That's a really difficult question to try and address. And, uh, you know, the only numbers that we have are what the engineer told us it was going to cost and what the bid actually shows. To try and answer the questions you're, you're asking, which are great questions, I don't think it's possible. You know, could we get our engineer to tell us what they think the lifespan of these pipes are? Sure, but what sort of guarantees can they provide about that? Really none. Uh, no one will. So we're left to try and just decide what's our comfort level versus that $200,000. Kelly? So do, so do we have an idea of how what the lifespan of the new replacing the pipes and putting entirely new pipes in? I mean, it seems to me we're talking 70, 70 years or something like that. Uh, but I, but I have no idea, and I don't think any of us have any idea of what this lining of the pipes. And you know, if that's forty years, um, and you have to do this re redo this project in forty years, are you going to pay for it twice and pay for it to replace them next time? Yeah, that that's really the dilemma that we're all faced with, and and there isn't a way to answer those questions. We don't even know the real lifespan of the PVC that might be, that was originally planned because those pipes haven't been in the ground historically for a long time. I don't think there's any 70 year old PVC out there in the ground. So that's what we think it's gonna last, but we, we don't really know. Kelly? Do we know? I got, well, I got some questions and I think Tom Nelson should have been part of this because the PUC should be able to tell us a few things. Um, when were the pipes put in that we are currently going to line instead of replace we should have that information in our coffers and available to us i mean if these pipes are 10 years old okay line them if these pipes are 50 years old then i would like to replace them and they're I quite a bit older than 50 should be available yeah they're they're all they were installed in the 30s and 40s and 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 maybe the 50s. So we're talking about um, very old pipe. It's clay pipe. It, it's uh, It's been there a while. So some of them could already be broken when they get down to them, potentially. Well, we do have good data about their condition. We, we've, uh, even this year, did a um, video inspection of the pipes from the inside. So we know what condition they're in. There are a few spots that are broken and need to be repaired, and that is included in KGM's uh, cost estimate. Oh, for, for doing it this, this way, for doing the lining? So that That's includes right. digging up the problem areas and, and actually repairing the pipes. Yes. Hmm. So that, that makes me inclined to say that we probably should, I'd rather spend the money now and make sure we're doing the right thing. So as we don't turn around to the citizens in five years from now or three when everybody's done and gone, and now we have a big issue and everything that's brand new, brand new blacktop, everything's all getting dug up. But that's my thoughts. I, I would, I would, uh, I mean, I guess as disappointed as I am at how far off, I think we all are as far off as what the estimates originally were, which came as a shock and how all this started. I find it like even reading the language, I guess like, maybe a question first, is this a, are we this is this number that they gave us in the change order that's a not to exceed or is there an op or is there still something that could come up and they're like actually it could cost more do we know that the if you look at the change order everything's based on estimated quantities and price per sure so uh the the quantities that we're using are generally known we're talking about length of pipe number of services number of manholes but uh, there's rock excavation in trench. You now that's not going to happen anymore. That was a variable cost before. Uh, th there's not a lot of 
of opportunity for this to be different than what they're telling us it's going to be. Um, and you're saying that with with the original six hundred and eighty seven thousand dollar replace all the pipes bid, um, that's the variable costs were in the excavation costs basically. Like that's the excavation, the 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 rock rock moving like running into rock problems and things like that. That's where the that's where the the variable costs were for that. And with doing the lining, we're just ignoring or we're, we're avoiding most of those those unknown costs. Is that kind of a summary of what you're saying? Yeah, that, that's a summary of what I'm saying. I would I would say that it says in the language too that in the areas that are unable to be lined that they will be doing spot repairs in those locations, right? And another big savings is the fact that we're not replacing now all of our enclosures are like sewer, sanitary sewer enclosures like the manhole mm -hmm. we're just lining right I, yeah I, that's right okay yeah i yeah i think that's a it's it's a really a bummer but i really think that this i mean maybe if we got an extra two maybe if it was a four hundred thousand dollar savings if they weren't able to keep two hundred thousand dollars of the you know value engineering aspect out of it that would be a different question but i feel like the numbers are a lot not that two hundred thousand dollars isn't a lot but i feel like obviously by them retaining 196 it makes that number of what our savings are to what it would cost just to go with the original plan and get everything brand new so we don't have to incur you know i mean is there a warranty on this you know like do we, yeah. do we have any guarantee that you know something happens i mean they're not going to come back five years from now and fix it for free or, you know, I assume. So, um, anyway, that, that it's pretty frustrating, but I don't, I don't think for what the net savings is that it, it means that we just try and deal with 70 year old clay pipe and hope that they, you know, patch and repair in those areas we can't line satisfactorily and that that's going to be able to, um, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a lifetime project really. And, uh, I don't feel like that solution isn't the solution. I guess I was expecting to come out of this. Um, I didn't expect basically a patch or lining job. I was expecting something different. Um, hopefully with cost savings. So I don't, I don't think it's personally, I don't, my feeling is I don't think it's worth saving the $200,000 um, and having a, a patched up system sitting underneath a brand new, brand new roadway. So, so that's, that's the, really the conversation that we need to have Anton is, is that value value calculation of, of um, you know, these two different solutions. Um, we don't have a lot of reassurance about the, uh, um, about the total cost of what it would be to, to do the original plan. You know, that's why I think part of the reason why the estimation was three times what they originally thought it would be. Um, but we do know what we end up with the final product. And so that's the, um, so that's kind of what we're, what we're weighing around here. And, um, we can continue talking about this, um, or if somebody does feel feel strongly about this enough to make a motion, then we can do that and we can continue discussion in that way. Um, but uh, I'm down for a continuing conversation like this first, if we need to still hash out some thoughts and some ideas um, too. So where are we at? Well, I would make a motion that we deny the change order and leave as is. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that. Yeah. Okay, I'd second okay. it. So Tim, Tim seconds that motion. Um, so any further discussion on this? You know, I think the points that have been made here are, are really important. Uh, it's not that $200,000 is an insignificant amount of money to save on this project, but I think when you're looking at a project that's a lifetime project, um, we want to do the right thing. And, and I, I'm not convinced that lining the pipes is really the right thing to do. Uh, I think uh, replacing and having some certainty as to the, the quality of what we have there and 
knowing it probably will um, last 70 years, like uh, the pipe that's currently in the ground now, um, is an important consideration. We just don't know what um, what might be the situation with lining the pipe, and I, and I just think that the savings of two hundred thousand um, dollars just doesn't warrant taking that risk. Another good point, Tim, on that too um, is that when they dig all this stuff up, they're going to be laying those pipes fresh again, you know, and and they're going to be able to to work with the materials that are around there. We don't know what materials are currently surrounding, you know, those that's migrated into the soils around those pipes that could be impacting the movement of those pipes with the frost and, and you know, well, I suppose they're probably below the frost line. But, um, but that, you know, I just keep thinking about different reasons why this doesn't sound like a super good idea. Um, any, any other discussion, any other thoughts on this? Well, are these sewer pipes, water pipes, combination of both? Storm sewer, sanitary sewer. This is it's all sanitary. sanitary. Okay. Now, if they choose to leave it in and line it, do they have to be? Is there other stuff buried next to these? Um, my thoughts are: Do they have to take more effort to be more careful, not to disrupt them by putting in new stuff next to them or buy them? Or, you know, I'm you know the point I'm making is. If you got to dig a hole and dig up this stuff, um, I think it'd be easier basically to replace it with new stuff since we're prepared to do that in the first place. I mean, that's just kind of my thought. Right. I think uh, that the sewer line runs alone, though, doesn't it, Mike? One side street. There's also some storm sewer, but that's above where the sewer line is, so it's not really... Uh, related to the project, there's a few water main crossing uh, in the vicinity of it. The, um, I mean, what I think what you're talking about, Craig, is something that we would have hoped would have affected the original price. So uh, and didn't. Well, I think if we were planning on lining them, it would have affected it. But we didn't know that that was an option. I didn't think it was an option. I thought this was all brand new stuff. I didn't know that. You know, there's ways that this could have been recalculated if we ever known that. Right. That's my take on it. So, okay. Cool. Any further discussion? All right, we're going to do a roll call vote on this. Starting from the top, Anton, your vote? Aye. Kelly, your vote? Aye. Craig, your vote? Aye. Tim, your vote? Aye. And I am an aye as well. I think we had a very good, robust conversation about this. Um, thank you for putting your thoughts to that. Um, that uh, change order has been denied. So uh, we're going to move right on then uh, from there to discuss the uh, financial uh, reports that we got from the park and from, um, sorry, I'm trying to scroll down to the right spot here, um, for the park and the, and the liquor store. So um, so the, the, the report that we got last Wednesday from Dave Tierstig and from Craig uh, showed us the, um, the plan for opening. Uh, we do have some of our, of our monthly people uh, in the campground right now, but not very many. Um, so I guess to go over the finer points, uh, Mike, would you be willing to break that down for us a little bit more? Um, I could I could go through it, but I think it would make more sense for you to, to just kind of hit the bullet points. <laughs> well, this is really a continuation of what you talked about last week, and, and it's more of a placeholder for continuing that conversation if you see the need to. And it was also just an opportunity to provide you with the same information that the park board had in front of them at their last meeting. So that with the park, it's very difficult to give you good projections on, on what's going to happen financially because we just don't know how we're going to be able to operate or what the demand is going to be for our service. We, we can make some projections, but they're all pretty speculative. But we do know some things about how we've performed in the past and so that's the type of information that Dave provided to the park board is how much 
were we making on, on some of these uh, things in the past? And we also provided the park board with some of the discussion about um, how we might operate the bathhouses in more detail. So that's there for your consideration as well. It's not anything that you need to talk about or take any action on. So the monthly versus overnight, and, and we'll just quickly look at that. Uh, last year, we collected $288,000 from 90 monthly sites. And that's about that's an average of 3,200 per monthly site for the entire season. And our 210 nightly sites, they yielded $865,000, averaging 4,119 per site. And of those 210, only 65 are full hookup. 82 are also electric water only and 57 are primitive. And I think what we're trying to demonstrate with that is if you take those primitive sites out of the mix, that even makes that daily site uh, seasonal total significantly higher. Um, and that it's not possible for us to operate as a seasonal only campground and perform financially anywhere near how we are used to performing. Even if we used all of the sites that we think we could put a um, RV in that's self-contained, um, we still don't have all of our sites, you know, available. Fifty-seven of them just wouldn't work. Uh, and and if we could get thirty-two hundred per site per season, it still wouldn't come anywhere near the type of income that we've been making on the dailies. So we just wanted to make sure everybody understood that when they were considering all their options, were you know, trying to continue. You know, just have seasonals all year, trying to maximize that, um, or trying to work on the bathhouse issues. And I think the park board did a very good job of, of starting that conversation and thinking about those issues, and I expect that they will have another good conversation about it at their regular meeting next week. So I don't know if you need to say any more about that, but I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you wanted to talk about it. To me, that seems like it's really just uh, a re-edification of the decision that the park board made um, to to open nightly uh, open back up nightly sites as as soon as we can figure out how to safely do it. So for me, I think that's fine. That's just fine for me. One of the other issues that we talked about was the issue of can we not open the bathhouses and offer more self-contained units, and we needed some additional direction from some of our state regulators and. And I think we're still working on that. We don't have a good update for you. Hopefully we will have one for the park board meeting next week. So okay. liquor store, if you want to talk about that next. Okay, let's move on. Unless somebody else has last call for the for the park or for the campground. Okay, liquor store it is. Go for it. This one's a little bit clearer. <laughs> when you look at the numbers. <laughs> it, it certainly is. Um, I don't have updates over the weekend, and it's possible that we did some uh, bigger number days over the weekend. But when we look at how things are performing, um, and we had a full month now of April where our doors were closed and we were doing curbside pickup. And you can see, uh, you know, April days of the week, uh, actually during the week this year, other than Sunday where we're closed, we've performed as well or better than the same days of the week during that same period of April last year. Mm -hmm. But Friday and Saturday, we're, we're not performing as well. Uh, and that line is just extremely flat. Um, and so when we look at what's our daily totals, what are we actually doing on a daily basis? It's, it's about, you know, five, to six thousand dollars a day pretty flat and and i think that is the way that we're currently operating that is the business that we should expect to continue so uh to put that in perspective in june um we expect to have five and six thousand dollar tuesdays and twelve and thirteen thousand dollar fridays and saturdays and in July, we won't have any five and six thousand dollar days. So, uh, and we'll have some fifteen plus thousand dollar days. So that just the ability to actually process orders through the facility is significantly slowed down. Uh, that combined with perhaps just slower traffic in the in the area and 
who knows what other factors are affecting people's buying decisions right now have kind of shown us this is this is what we can do with this so what are we doing about that well first of all if this is how we operate the rest of the year let's just talk about that first of all uh, it it will be a significantly smaller amount of total uh, revenue but it's also a smaller amount of expenses our number one expense in the liquor store is buying product so for selling less product we're also buying less product so then the question is with the markup on that product can we afford to pay our staff and can we afford to pay our general fund property tax write down mm -hmm. in the month of april we did uh, we paid our staff and we paid our monthly share of the two hundred thousand dollars that we use to write down property taxes uh, but i don't think that we should expect that to continue um, i think that we'll probably end up losing some money but maybe not quite as much as we thought we would um, if if we have to do this for much longer uh, what else are we doing about it in the near term then uh, we've increased the number of phone lines that are available over there we're going to be able to operate with taking more phone orders soon um, that's one of our pinch points is we've got two lines there right now and when one person's taking an order and one person's calling to say they're there and, and it's just not enough we need to be able to take more orders more quickly uh, we were also uh, of course have some concepts about how to let people back in the store and we've got thankfully some of our local businesses that are currently doing that and kind of working through the difficult parts for us and we can actually witness it in action. That's like I asked if anybody had been to IGA yet and, and I've had some uh, firsthand reports about, yeah, it works, but there is some real difficulty in maintaining social distancing when somebody's in front of you in the aisle and they're stopping and looking for the product that they want and, and you either have to wait for them or, uh, you know, at the volume board, we're doing an $18,000 Saturday at the liquor store it's just not going to be possible to maintain social distancing within the store. And we're not set up to do what I think is the strategy for most success in some of these places, which is to have some sort of person at the store's entryway to, to provide some guidance. Uh, and, and people remember what the store looks like. The, the aisles are narrow and you really can't get past the entrance um, without standing in the area where people are waiting to check out. So. Uh, it, it's going to be a real challenge to think about how to get people into the store uh, at all to try and increase those sales volumes. But that's what we'll be working on because I don't think we want to keep doing this all year at, at five and six thousand dollar days. Okay. So if we add lines, are we adding staff? I happened to come down this weekend and pick up an order. I got through relatively easy just by kind of redial, redial. Um, I've had somebody locally who told me it took them over two hours and they kind of gave up and went, well, you know, I can wait. Um, I also had staff who I'm very concerned about. They are being berated and belittled and called names that I can't repeat here. They're sworn at. Um, some have been brought to tears. Some say they're ready to go do something else, even though it's money. Um, I don't know if we're looking at increasing our hours, uh, probably on a holiday weekend. I know we weren't sure what to expect, but there are people around. And I think as long as there's no longer a stay at home order, people are going to travel here. Um, and I want, I want us to do what we can to try to alleviate some of that for them. Um, so I'm just wondering personnel wise, I mean, when will we have the phone lines and then who's going to staff them? Because four phone lines are only good if four people are answering them, which I recognize costs us more money by having people answer. People are running stuff out. People are stocking and running credit cards. And I can't imagine being them. My heart goes out to them. I am very sympathetic. And then to be called names and sworn at. It's, yeah, it's pretty disappointing, some of the behavior that they do have to deal with. And I don't know of a good strategy to avoid that. Um, I mean, we need to just hope that people can, can treat each other a little bit better. Um, but, but we see it, it's not always happening. Uh, right now, we're, we're giving our employees that are there 
you know, very similar hours to what they've had in the past and we're open significantly fewer hours. Uh, it's just a lot more labor intensive to do it this way when we have to do all the shopping for everybody. And, um, yeah, you know, we're hiring right now more part-time folks and hope to get some more help on. And I think one of the reasons we want to do that is just to alleviate some of that pressure that you're talking about on our existing staff and, and be able to have more folks there, uh, you know, to try and get that volume up. When will we have the increased phone lines, Mike, and how many will there be? Well, we, um, we don't uh, necessarily have to pick a number. The, the strategy we're using to get more phone lines is to do it over the uh, voice over the internet, and we'll be able to just add as many lines as we want, I think. Um, so our pinch point's gonna be how many people can we have and how many phones can we have in there? Uh, and even then it's, it's uh, I mean, we can't have five people answering the phone and shopping in there. It would, it would be, I mean, th there's still some physical limitations to what we're gonna be able to process doing it, all the shopping for folks in that space. And, and I don't know, I don't have an update on when it's gonna be ready. I don't know if Patrick, you do, or, or Kim, you do. The phones have been shipped, so they should be here shortly. What does shortly mean, Patrick? Sorry. I'm, I'm not sure. I just got that message from, I checked on, on where the phones were this morning and the email I got back was that they, they've been shipped. So I, I will follow up on when they'll get here. You know, and I, I don't know that it's possible. I've said I would go volunteer and go in and stock for them or something. If me, I just, I really felt awful when somebody brought my bag out and I said, I really want to know how it's going. And they answered me truthfully. I, my heart hurt. That's nobody should have to be treated how some of these guys are getting treated. It's really sad. I would agree with that. You know, I have, I have a question just about the, uh, the, the, the graph that you presented for the April sales, you know, where you're saying it's, it's pretty flat and then it kind of bumps up for the weekend. You know, my, my concern is that, you know, April is still where there are still very few visitors here and that we're going to see the visitors, um, you know, increase. Uh, I mean, we saw how many were around this weekend. Um, I don't know what the difference might have been from previous Memorial weekends, but certainly there were, there were a lot of, a lot of visitors here. And even though you might not have uh, numbers, uh, I can, can only guess that uh, sales, sales were up uh, this weekend over weekends, weekends in April. Um, and, and I think that we're going to continue to see, you know, people wanting to get here and, and the issue of, of uh, the, the, the store employees dealing with people that are unfamiliar with our system and, you know, this is going to continue on. So, I mean, I think we need to really think about how we're going to handle everything and, and protect our employees and, and make sure that, you know, our customers can get service, but our employees are also protected and not being uh, kind of just put out there to be uh, berated and belittled and uh, abused by uh, people that just don't understand um, situations. So, I mean, I just hope we can do, do more to, to help our employees. Yeah, and that's like what Mike said before. That's that's kind of an that's kind of a hard um, it's kind of a hard thing to do when you know we're trying to to also manage uh, people's behavior. Um, it's yeah, that's really hard. I think the best thing we can do is we can we can continue to support our staff and then um, as best we can and see what uh, how we can kind of lessen the blow. You know, also communicate to the public what we expect for for their participation. And um, hopefully that'll, hopefully that'll get somewhere. We'll get people to start at least thinking about it. So, yeah. yeah. And thanks, thanks to, thanks to the liquor store staff for, for figuring this all out. You know, I mean, they're figuring out, everybody's figuring this stuff out, but they're working it every day and having to put up with it. So I guess I think uh, recognition and appreciation of that by all of us is important. Mm hmm I would agree. Mike, do you have anything further about the, the financials? No. 
Okay, then let's, let's move on to the, the, the City Hall Liquor Store design update. So, so it looks like we have some, um, we have some, some numbers and some more uh, materials coming from, uh, coming from a golf construction as well. Um, why don't you break it down for us again? The first part of it, the fee proposal and, um, and the assumptions for the proposal from LHB appears to be pretty similar to, um, to what it was before, if not identical. And then the yeah, it's, it's I just resent it to you for a, a reminder so that we have it in front of us if we need to talk about it. In my right. memo, I, I um, addressed the issues that you asked about when we had it in front of you the first time, the answers that we got from LHB. And then we also have the additional information from McGough after they've had a chance to look at the building. Um, so pretty much what uh, LHB has been telling us in terms of a cost estimate, it's uh, $5.3 million. And that does not include some things that I think are fairly significant. Uh, you know, FF&E in City Hall and the liquor store includes things like coolers and shelving and a lot of other stuff that that it'll probably be a fairly substantial price and so uh you know this isn't a final number this is a first first crack at it i'll be meeting with lhb and mcgoff on friday to talk through how we want to proceed with these numbers and what are the other things we want them to look at for us and mcgoff also has a number of ideas on ways that we could reduce the cost if we wanted to. Uh, you know, those things are by reducing the, the quality or, or the, you know, what we're investing in. So, but that's why we wanted them at the table because we want to have that, the construction folks ideas about different ways to do it. Sometimes the architects and the construction folks just, you know, they're different perspectives. It's good to have them both at the table. So, um, if we want to continue this process, I guess is the question in front of you now. Do we do we proceed with LHB's proposal to do the design work? Um, do you need any more information about their proposal before you make that decision? Uh, do you want to wait and see more about the cost estimate after we've met on Friday? And do you have any direction for me about anything you'd like to see done with the cost estimate? Mike, I have a quick question because I can't remember and uh, I'm putting you on the spot but when we did all of our budget and start setting out our tax levy and looking forecasting how does this 350,000 and then this in theory 5.2 5.3 million how does that affect things as we've planned out currently before COVID Oops, you're muted. <laughs> I think he's trying to get some info for you too. I know I'm putting him on the spot, so thank you. I don't have stuff available right here. Yeah, I was hoping that'd be super available, but uh... Let me see what I can find. So um, first of all, we had the cost of the project at 4 million in our capital improvement plan. So that's, um, you know, the first effect of a, of a being five and a half or $6 million project is that the amount of money that we'll have to borrow to make this happen is quite a bit higher. That debt payment on that amount will be quite a bit higher. And it, it will have an effect on, on the future budget. When we looked at the, the three-year analysis of uh, not just 2020, but 21 and 22, we had anticipated taking on a new project payment of $200,000 annually that was going to be this project's uh, payment. Um, you know, that's all when we're doing analysis at that level, that's, you know, back of the napkin stuff still to figure out, well, how much money can you borrow for 200,000? Well, it depends on how many years you want to pen, spend paying it back, what the interest rates are. There's a lot of factors involved in that. Um, 
but we can't borrow three million dollars i don't think for two hundred thousand or five million dollars if that's what it takes our, our original concept in our capital improvement plan was to spend uh more than half of this as cash on hand rather than borrowing it so we had we have just over a million dollars a million three in the liquor fund that we said we would make available for this that um that's probably not available for this anymore particularly if we have a few bad months of a, of our summer season here that that's where that money's going to come from any losses are going to come right out of that liquor reserve and and uh you know the same thing goes for our general fund reserves we were probably looking at about a million or a million and a half of cash that we wanted to put towards this project out of the general fund reserves and it's hard to say whether that is still uh a good idea kim's been working on some cash flow projections just to kind of get a handle on all right well if things are are bad in 2020 you know how much cash are we going to have on hand that's available for it I think the conservative estimate is that if it's a six million dollar project, we'll have to borrow at least four of it to to do this, and um, you know that that'll be that's quite a bit more than we had expected. Right. Yep. So that's so our consideration then has to be: Are we ready to move forward on this? Um, or do we want to continue to move forward on this with that that assumption? Um, and also, uh, or are there other other instructions that we should be looking at for um, for McGough and for Mike to be trying to figure out? Um, I have a, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one of those thoughts is that that the reconstruction of City Hall is going to have to happen at some time. Like it's definitely going to have to happen. And I can't imagine that anything's going to get any cheaper. I do think that perhaps this is a little bit of a wake-up call for us to take a look at the scope of the plan and see what we can do for efficiencies within that plan to um, to 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 shrink that budget a little bit. And I know that there's there's we designed it so that it would meet all of our needs, and that was the that was the real conversation that we had had primarily when we sat down with LHB was. Well, what do we need? And then what we ended up getting is a very, a very nice looking what we need. Um, but I'm wondering how we can dial that back a little bit. So that's my that's my thought on it. I don't think that we're gonna event we're gonna save any money um, by by putting the project off. I think that it's just going to get more expensive, um, no matter how much cost cutting we try and do in the future. Um, but I, I did. Yeah. I did uh, just take a quick look since I've got everything open here. It, if we spend, if we have a twenty-year bond and it's three percent interest, then that four million dollars of borrowing is about two hundred and seventy thousand dollars payment a year. Uh, maybe we can beat that interest rate because the markets are crazy, or you know nobody's actually selling municipal bonds right now. I don't think so. Uh, who knows what effect that would have on it? Uh, so it's not like another two hundred thousand annually. It's it's another seventy thousand annually to get to four million, and maybe another hundred thousand to get to five million. So it's not an insurmountable amount. If you want to think about, um, I mean, you can't really give clear, direct feedback on how to save money in the project because there's not a lot of details attached to the preliminary concept. the The number one cost driving factor is square footage and the so some factors that could affect the total project budget are aeoa and the chamber are finding um, aeoa is looking for a new home right now jim's at his own office and probably won't come back uh, it's possible that we won't have any partner space needs in 2021 and uh, you know we just need to find room for mary and there's room for mary in the eda in our existing office the way it's drawn uh, and so, you know, it wouldn't be room for us to expand and the EDA to expand at the same time, but there would be um, an opportunity to look at making that smaller. And then, of course, the council chambers is still big enough for 75 people. Uh, it's really, really hard right now to think about what the council chambers should look like 20 years from now, because it's been empty for three months. 
and it doesn't seem likely that it's always going to be empty. It seems much more likely that we're going to be back to business as usual, having public meetings at some point in our lives. But how do we how do we think about that right now? Uh, it, it, but it's really made me wonder if that section needs to get smaller as well. And then the liquor store, I think, is really the only piece that is somehow not going to be affected by any of what's going on now in terms of our desire to change it. Right. And I think that I'm, I'm fine with that. I think I do think that there it make there's it makes a lot of sense to have the liquor store be as functional and as profitable as we can make it. So. Right. Yeah, I would, I would like to uh, join in with what Mike has said and what Jay has said, too. I'm, I'm concerned that we might be uh, a little extravagant in the sizing of the uh, council chambers and the additional offices for the uh, um, users that may or may not uh, be interested. Um, even even the city hall portion of it, uh, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, all the offices, all the space, all the meeting rooms are, you know, completely necessary. You know, I think one of the things we're learning with uh, the COVID issue is that people are a lot more willing to work uh, independently and don't need to necessarily come together other than on uh, uh, on video. Um, so we might be seeing more of that uh, occurring in the future. The idea that that uh, we have to have a council chambers to accommodate 75 people. And I mean, I just think back over the 20 years I've been on the council and how many times we've had that many people in, in our council chambers and it's been a handful, not not what I would call, uh, you know, making it a need, a need to invest in uh, having that size, that size space. So there may be some ways to uh, reduce the size, which would hopefully reduce the cost and maybe put it more back in line to closer to what we, th we thought it uh, might have been. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> Mike, it seems like that's some, at least a little bit of an attitude. You're getting a sense of the attitude of the different counselors. At some point, you'll need to actually authorize their design work. Now, the contract that we're going to use, we talked about that at the last meeting, that it's a form that we spent quite a bit of time modifying uh, during the Public Works Garage project. And I don't have that ready for you right now to, to actually read through and vote on. Um, but you've already approved that language. So if you're willing to just, you know, do some sort of head nodding motion that the price and the scope of work that they're providing looks right, then we'll let them know. And I've already asked them to get the B133 form that we talked about last time prepared for us. Well, my, my take on it is that I'd like to see the, the budget come down <laughs> um, from where it is right now. <clears throat> um, but as far as the, the, the gist of the plan that we have, I appreciate the plan. Now, I also don't want this to be basically like me saying, like, I want it all, but I don't want to pay for it because I totally understand there's a correlation between those two things. So... I don't know how we can take that to the next level or not, but. Can I, uh, I, I agree with Jay. I mean, I do think it makes sense to move forward, but I'm a little hesitant on the creeping number. And of course, more than likely when we actually see the real drawings and all that, it probably will be higher. Um, on the last page of McGough's report, it's like Morse code. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and that shows like the percentage breakdown, you know, like I think it's important, the list of things that are included and in exclusions um, as they work through things. Um, but I'm just wondering, for me, it would be helpful to see, you know, what, where, where are some of those, um, you know, like what is the one that's 86%? And what is the one that's 0.01%? <laughs> right. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know that, that, that would be helpful for me and not that I don't know what we would do with that. It just seems like good information. Maybe I saw that too. I don't want to vote and talk about something when I don't have the full information. The dot, it, dot. Are you saying it's not legible? No. Yeah. Just it's all dot. Let me see if I can share my screen and show it to you. I've got two computers running right now, so it'll just take me a moment. Hmm. I agree, Anton. Well, I, yeah, I just, I just, I mean, even the FFE, FF and E is. I mean, I don't even know. Wait, you know, I don't know. Can we? Can we get? Is it? Is it a hundred thousand dollars or is it three hundred thousand dollars? I know it's not included in the number, but well, and there's a lot of exclusions listed on that thing from McGough too, and that's one of the things that I would, I would really appreciate to know what those exclusions, what the primary tally or you know like a preliminary tally for what those exclusions would cost the city as well. Because well, I mean, like looking at some of those exclusions, I mean, there's we're probably talking another million bucks worth of exclusions. So is, oh yeah. is this the sheet you're looking for? Yes, that definitely is not the one we got. That is the one we were looking for. Okay, can you see everything on here? Yes. I tried. I just tried to scroll down on your screen, Mike. Sorry, there is no scroll down. That's it, right there. Yeah, there. There's more. That's the second oh. half. I did too, Jay. Don't feel bad. <laughs> Tell me what you'd like to look at, and I'll send it up to there. Oh, I think that's good. I mean, so that that makes sense. That that eighty six percent line was a subtotal line, so that right. is helpful to know. Can you go back yeah. up to the top? Let's Mike? look at that. That's where all the action is. Yeah. So, so is that not, the exclusions aren't nothing, right? I mean, there's quite a most of the building is included in this. The FF and E is is just, uh, and let me see what they said about that. Can you scroll it down just a bit so we can see that red bar, what it says? The other direction. The other direction, right at the top. That There you go. If you Got can, it. Oh, there we go. Is that, can I, did, am I recollecting right? Uh, were we looking at the 16,000 square foot number? I thought we were looking at like a 14,000 square foot number, weren't we? Uh, that's what I'm wondering. I, I don't. I'm trying to remember back to those other meetings, but I sixteen. I felt that seems big. No, this is what we were looking at. Um, okay. Brian I, D. Right. <laughs> I I still think there's an opportunity to make it smaller. Yeah, if we didn't have those extra offices uh, for AEOA in the chamber and EDA, could could we minimize then the size of the lobby too? I mean, that seems like that was where there's a lot of uh, wasted space having that lobby that makes uh, a corridor to access those uh, additional offices. Yeah, I think that's good questions. Mm -hmm. We enter into this contract because we hadn't set anything in stone. We still have the ability to to all that and bring it down, right? I think for the sake of things, though, yeah. I'm gonna yeah. stop sharing my screen now. If that's all right. Sure. 
for the sake of the work that they're going to put in, though, I think it's just important to make sure that maybe we clarify or try and finalize our own thoughts on what it is that we want. If, you know, if we're seeing these numbers based on this, does it make sense for us not to slow things down, but to like take the time to say like, okay, let's go 50 people in the council chambers and downsize that, you know, like let's eliminate these extra offices short of maybe some flexible space that should the need arise, we can use that. It can be used for other meetings. You know, some of those things, I mean, at 16,000 square feet and five and a half million dollars with many things not accounted for. I don't know. I have to turn my calculator sideways, I think, to get that big of a number on there, but. Right. I, I think that those are all, those are all probably things we should, we should investigate. Um, you know, if, if the, if it is the, the, the will of the council to that we um, that we look at ways that we can cut the budget down. Then you know what that's going to mean is that's going to mean a smaller a smaller facility um, with less stuff going on inside of it. Um, I mean, as a quick based on their their ballpark or on their numbers, it's like three forty eight or something, three forty five somewhere like that per square foot. So if you knocked off two thousand square feet, that's a savings of six hundred eighty seven thousand dollars. I don't know if we have 2,000 square feet within that, within the lobby, within those offices, within some of those things that what we've talked about here tonight to do that. But at least then our starting off point in kind of a, you know, I mean, in some of those things, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I think between the lobby and the offices, there's more than 2,000 square feet. Um, the council chambers is about 2,000 square feet right now. So I, I think there's, that like I said, there's still significant ability to make this building smaller if we're willing to give up some of the things that were in it, like offices for other tenants, some of that public space, some of the room in the council chambers. Yeah. I, I, I would be, I mean, yeah, because, geez, at, at, if you can, you know, another, yeah, if you could, if you could knock it down, down to 13, for, you know, 13,000, say 14 or even 13,000 square feet, that's a uh, significant, obviously there's going to be some costs that are kind of fixed, you know, um, with demolition and with infrastructure and those kinds of things, but everything else we can do to save square footage is just going to be a savings. And, um, I feel a little hesitant at the current number to say go. I also don't want to be, the one that's like slows this down because i do think it's super important for us to do um i think that all of the things happening right now has made it harder for us to maybe focus and talk more about it um because of despite meeting every week instead of every other week i feel like it's you know it's just different so um and i do think that the realization like tim had brought up of how things are being conducted now um it kind of changes maybe what what those needs are going to be um instead of using assumptions of partner groups wanting to join in you know it seems like more of a well let's maybe plan like i say like some flex space if there is something that happens in the future or there is growth but not to just assume that now because you know it seems like that that's changed it's changed in the last three months so Anyway, I'll shut up, but that's my... my well, and, and Anton, to, to, ex, to extend on what you're saying, I, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. And um, I do think that, you know, the number gives us cause to actually slow down and think about what we're what exactly we're talking about here. Um, those office spaces, you know, that was obviously a pretty premium, th like, thing that we definitely wanted, not def not something that we specifically needed. Um, as far as flex space, I do think that we could probably still have there be some flex space inside that building um, for additional meeting rooms and for, you know, even potentially a future office if we saw so fit. But, um, but for now, I, I think that what you're saying is, is going down the right, um, 
going down the right avenue to say that can we constrict the um, the city hall part of that building um, to make it, you know, a couple thousand square feet smaller because the savings on that are actual. And we know that that's, you know, we're not going to really be able to get that 340 some dollar a square foot number down too much um, just because of the quality of construction we're talking about. Um, but in decreasing the actual size of the building is really where we're going to see savings. Um, I think that's the right tactic. I mean, and I, and I don't want to come off of what we were talking about previously with uh, this is also a lifetime project, you know, uh, much like doing sewer lines. Um, so I don't want to not be thoughtful about like the choices that we make to do that. But again, if you use those numbers and you can find 2,500 square feet of savings, like that is eight hundred and forty thousand dollars mm -hmm. you know like that gets us i mean that it's a lot of money back where we want to be and, the other and, and maybe it isn't i'm sorry kelly i'll shut uh, but maybe it isn't that you know i'm just those are just like numbers and looking at what that difference makes and it really does change um my like enthusiasm because i am excited for it but i'm not as excited for it with everything happening at five and a half million dollars, knowing it's going to be more. And I think I could support more wholeheartedly and still be excited about it. Um, trying to think a little smarter and a little harder on the design and um, be able to stand behind it. Right. Kelly. The other thing I think about as, and I'm, I'm for reducing space and moving forward but then we also have to work with um, the contractors, I think, in planning that, okay, so we're kind of planning for now and maybe the next five years in city hall space. I think we're looking forward much more for the liquor store as we should, because that's a great source of revenue for the city. Um, but as we look at city hall, you know, what can it do for us now, maybe in the five, six, seven, eight year future? And then, how do we plan it so that if in 10 years we need to do something somewhat robust, we still have a south area we can move into? I mean, I know it's a parking lot, but it is ours that we can make some choices and changes. You know, maybe I know that we want the bathrooms visible for public, but is there signage that we could do to move the bathrooms maybe to a different spot so that if we want to actually spread our wings in 10 years, and move out that we can do that. So I just think we have some opportunity to go back and revisit things, save money right now where we need to, but leave some space that, you know, in 10 years, another council can make some decisions based upon what's happening then. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right on Kelly. I think there's an ability for us to still maintain a little flexibility outside the space that we build as long as we're intentional about that and and uh and i i think i've heard enough from you all to know how to have the conversation on friday so um if if there's still some hesitancy to take any official action on this right now then i'll just communicate that to lhb and of course this is a public meeting that they'll be able to watch and they can see exactly where you're all coming from but that we want to see the fruits of some of that cost reduction conversation and we also of course need to see the actual contract be produced so hopefully they'll still be willing to to jump into this knowing where you are in the process and uh we'll, we'll report back after after that meeting are we looking for a motion to move forward with this is that needed tonight well it's not Technically, um, I think, you know, maybe Anton brought up earlier that the architects are going to be investing and, you know, beyond what we've already hired them to do from this point out, their time in this project. And I don't think that's unfair of us to ask them to do based on where we're at on it. Um, but if you knew for sure that you wanted to do this, that you still want to move forward with the design process and you've got some parameters about how you want to see it go and some direction about things you want them to work on, but you know, you're going to do it. I think that that sort of emotion would be um, welcome anyway. But like I said, if, if you're not ready for that, that's what I'll communicate to LHB and I will expect them to, to continue based on where we're at. 
Uh, what, what does everybody think about that? And that kind of where we're at? I'd like to see us continue to move forward. So um, I'm just trying to think. I don't have my – trying to think of what I want to say to a motion. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't know if we necessarily need to have a motion. It's kind of, we could just do a head nod thing. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then just have my move forward with that understanding. I, I also, I agree with you, Kelly. I feel like we should continue to move forward. Um, I feel like there's, uh, the time is, is as close to right as it's going to be for us to, to be taking on this project and that we probably just need to do a little bit of tweaking on the design so that we can make sure that it's the right cost for the, for the city and provides the right things. So that's where I'm at. Anybody else? Thoughts? Comments? Well, I think we'll probably just take that silence as a, as a summary of what we had said before, um, a summary of the conversation. <clears throat> Mike, do you feel like that's, do you feel like you're in a comfortable place to move forward with the conversations? As much as can be, I can work with that. Okay, well, we're gonna let you work with that then. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna move on. Um, pull up the letter that we got, or the, um, it's, I guess it's a letter and an, and an application um <clears throat> for from grandma raised uh llc for an application for a temporary sidewalk cafe um for grandma Ray's, uh restaurant so what they're looking to do is they're looking to um to put up uh i believe four is it four tables i have to I have to read through to, for specifics. Um, they're looking at doing uh, doing tables in front of their um, their building, their grandma raised building, socially distanced, so that they can continue to um, to offer at least some uh, service uh, out front of their of their building. I believe he said there were four tables that they could fit out there, um, and they also would like to do. Um, alcohol service there. So the so the questions that we have to take a look at is, um, is what are the requirements that we have to have them for licking uh, for liquor serving, um, in an outdoor space like that, um, and are there any other things that we need to consider with the street light in its current location, in that area? So um, that's my understanding of it. Um, Mike, I don't know if you want to add any additional um, any additional thoughts to that uh, for our consideration. Oh, mute. Does everybody have the photo that I sent earlier? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. I'll I'll put it up. So I really, because this came late and I had no chance to see anything till I think it was about six o'clock. Um, I don't, I don't feel like I have enough information or I've even been given a chance to think about this. This, well, let's talk a little bit about it and see if we can get anywhere. This is one of those issues where everything's just come up so fast. And, and if we spend the time that an issue like this is really due, um, they might be already back to service inside the building by the time you know we would give thoughtful consideration to it. This is the front of the building, and there are uh, the plan is to put two tables that take about half of the sidewalk um, on each side of the door, and so I'll put that up as well. Um, Yeah, so they're talking about they're talking so here's about the, four here, tables. Here's the door, and then they would have you know two tables on this side where the street light is here, two tables on this side. They're saying these are four foot tables, uh, and this is nine and a half feet from the curb to the full extent of their building. So I've got some major concerns about this um, because 
this space right here, if we go back to the photo image, is it's going to be pretty tight with a four foot table. And, and uh, I just, I'm not sure how to maintain pedestrian traffic through there and allow them to have tables in that sidewalk area. On the other hand, they've been given no good options on how to try and continue their business. And the state's telling restaurants and, and really cities to be flexible and thoughtful about how we can help them do what the state's allowing, which is at least for the next two weeks, starting June 1st, provide outdoor seating and regular service. Um, beyond just the accessibility and pedestrian access issues, they, they'll be serving alcohol outside um, on our, our public right of way. And so I know uh, Chris sent me a note that he's dealt with this or has been asked to deal with this with some of his other cities. So can probably get us up to speed fairly quickly on an emergency ordinance and license. But again, I just, I don't know how to put that in front of you with no notice and no chance to read any of it. So I haven't asked him to do that yet. And I thought instead, let's just talk about the concept and see what we want to do. I have not had any other restaurants approach me about this. I think maybe the other ones have some ability to provide outdoor service or they're not intending to. And, uh, but I haven't heard from any of the other restaurants in town that they would like to do this. You know, I can certainly sympathize with the businesses, you know, wanting to try to get open and, you know, offer some level of service that is other, th other than just strict takeout, especially, especially for visitors. Uh, um, yeah, I'm uncomfortable about giving some kind of a, a open-ended license, but, you know, I would be open to a, a short-term permit of some sort that would allow them to, to do something in this period of time, um, provided we can come up with some standards that we think are, are reasonable for, uh, for the use of our sidewalks. Uh, I mean, I think social distancing is important. Uh, you know, whether four tables is workable, I really couldn't tell you. I mean, I've been up and down that street enough times and, you know, I know that there's a little bit more depth because the, the angle of that building, it's kind of indented uh, towards, the, to, towards the doorway. So it's the sidewalk's a little bit wider than, than um, the normal sidewalk, but still whether you can get four tables in there and do it uh, and still maintain social distances on the sidewalk, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe, maybe we allow two or three tables, uh, you know, to just give them, give them that option. Um, you know, I, I, and I'd like to hear from Chris too about just the liability side that the city might uh, be taking on. I know we've, we've issued licenses to other businesses for putting things on the uh, city city sidewalk, but uh, I don't know that we've ever given anybody permission to actually run their business on the city sidewalk. Right. Um, I do think that there are ways that we can do that. And I do think that, that um, offering a, um, you know, or creating some, some guidelines that, that restaurants could attend, you know, could, could abide by and then operate in such a manner um, until they're allowed to open, to open back up and operate inside. Um, I do view that as something that could, we could do in an, in an emergency way. Um, and I do think that for the, you know, for a lot of the food businesses, uh, food restaurant businesses that we have in the, um, in the city, that's, this is, this is a very real existential threat for them right now. Um, so anything that we can do, I think is, is really a big, uh, um, is a big perk. Uh, I guess maybe Mike, maybe what you were saying before is the right thing to do that you and Chris sit down and have and have a conversation and draft some language and have it ready for for a future meeting, um, like a, a soon future meeting. Um, but the one question I have, maybe Chris, since you're on the call, um, if we're doing uh, alcohol or liquor service on on a street like that, is there a need for an enclosure to it? There isn't a need for an enclosure necessarily. Um, 
they they do ha would they would have to have some expansion of their liquor license premises, which has to be compact and contiguous to the to the business. I have you know we have. I have six or seven cities that have requested assistance on this from us already. And so because of the number of cities that requested assistance, we decided that we were going to try to develop one sort of process to do this, as opposed to trying to develop six or seven different processes based on what each individual city wanted, because the time frame is so tight here. Um, and so what we, what we ended up doing was put together an emergency ordinance that basically authorized the use of the sidewalk. Some of these cities also want to authorize the use of parking spaces to allow some of the restaurants to use that as another expansion area for, uh, and, and both for service of food as well as sale and consumption of alcohol. Um, some cities have also looked at wanting to include potential street closures as well. So there are a number of different options that could be, you know, put in an emergency regulation like this. And so the document that we've developed includes a lot of these options in it as optional things that the city could either choose to include or not. Now, coupled with that is also a license agreement. And the, the ordinance generally allows use of the sidewalk. It has certain requirements in it for you know maintaining ada accessibility uh along the sidewalk and and doing those kinds of things but we wanted to make the process a relatively administratively simple process as well so that you know city staff did not have you know 20 different applications that we have to process so the license agreement is primarily related to to those businesses that want to sell liquor um, the ordinance basically gives non-liquor license, non-liquor selling businesses the opportunity to use the sidewalk. Um, and like, for example, in a couple of the cities, they not only wanted to be able to have restaurants do this, but they wanted to have some of the just local retailers so that they could put, you know, racks of clothing out on the sidewalk or, you know, something to that effect. So there are a number of options and I can certainly provide Mike, um, you know, the, the emergency regulation that we put together as well as the license agreement. And, uh, we could have some discussions about, about that. And, um, I can certainly share that with you too, Jay, if you and Mike want to try and think about, you know, working through some of that. So you guys can talk about that. And then, you know, again, um, I think you still have, a. um, a uh, special meeting set up for next week, right? Mm -hmm. so, you know, I just, I think add this to the agenda for next week and you can act on it next Wednesday. You know, if it's yeah. something that you want to do, of course. I think, I think it's a pressing enough thing that we should be prepared to take action on it. If there's, if there's something that we can do. Um, that's, and that, that's, I do feel pretty strongly about that. Um, we also, uh, I mean, we should also be aware that, that, the business owners on that stretch of, of First Street or First Avenue West um, from Wisconsin Street to Highway 61, um, they're all in conversation right now about, about requesting street closure for that, for that street, which is something that we can talk about at a later date. But I also just wanted to make sure that, that, was, that we were aware that that's something that those, those businesses are talking about. So okay. if we're, yeah, Go ahead. If they do that, and I'm sorry to break in. Whatever we do, I think we should decide to do it and keep it fair. So if we were going to close First Avenue for those businesses, are we then going to close Wisconsin for the rest of them? And are we going to close Broadway? You know what I mean? So whatever we do, I think we should try to be as fair as we can. I mean, Grandma Race has come forward with us now and asked for permission, which is awesome. But as we plan, then I think we should think about, well, we have Gunflint Tavern who could ask, maybe south of the border would ask, maybe Spaninoli's, I don't know if I'm missing anybody. Uh, Birch Terrace has the ability to serve outside already. Um, so I think we need to plan for those others that could come forward so that we're not 
being inclusive to certain groups or businesses. You know okay. what I mean? I, I, think, I, think, I think if we can get that information from Chris and that it basically becomes like, here's our, you know, based on these times, like our, it's, this is our new procedure, right? So it's like, here, you show us these things that you're going to meet these requirements that allows it to take place on the public right away. And, and then we can, we still would have to do it case by case, right? But it's, we're not, we're not setting up, a, the bar is the same all the way across, you know, right. and, and it might be potentially because of where their location is that they can't maybe meet some of those requirements, but we're not, you know, we're not, we're not just like, yes, no, no, yes, yes. Right. It's, it's, it's based on an understanding of um, what is going to protect the city ultimately, and hopefully allow them to be able to try and um, open back up uh, for the, you know, safety of people and the survival of their business. So I think it's just important to be uniform. Okay. One, one other thing just to cover with uh, Tim had had asked a question about liability issues. Um, and the regulation that we put together has both, you know, and it, you know, basic insurance requirement as well as an indemnification requirement. So if there's a use of the, of the right of way for this purpose, these businesses, uh, presumably have some level of liability insurance that they carry um, and that they would be required to indemnify the city if there's claims related to their use. So we would be covering that too, Tim. Okay. Yeah. And related to that, you know, I would want to make sure that, you know, if we did allow a business to operate uh, on, on city, city right away, that they'd be required to, you know, manage their own trash, not, uh, using the city's green trash containers, uh, you know, expect the city to to take care of that. Uh, that the uh, at the end of every day, or at least during periodically, that they would make sure that they would clean the the sidewalk if that's what they're using, uh, to make sure that there isn't litter and whatever that uh, would would be be a burden to the city. Okay, so Chris, can you work on that and get get some Chris and Mike? You can work on some of that and that language and bring it back to us next Wednesday or there, but there's about. Well, yeah, we'll I, 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 I can I can send Mike something you know right away tomorrow morning. Cool, and we'll have a, a packet for next Wednesday then that we'll have you um, tomorrow or Friday morning so you can take a look at these things before you have to think about it. Great, that sounds wonderful. Okay, so thank you. Um, thank you for that conversation. Um, any any further comments on that? All right. So the next uh, agenda item that we have on this meeting um, is to discuss uh, some legal strategy regarding a pending um, litigation in the matter of uh, Mike's Holiday Incorporated versus the state of Minnesota at all, which includes the city of Grand Marais. Um, the, this portion of the properly noticed regular meeting of the city council of the city of Grand Marais will be closed pursuant to Minnesota statute section 13D.05 subdivision 3B under the attorney client privilege exception to the Minnesota open meeting law. Um, city's need for confidentiality outweighs the purposes served by the open meeting law in this case based on the following. Um, absolute confidentiality is necessary so that the city council and legal council can have a candid and open discussion to determine the available legal options to handle the pending litigation, including strategy at any possible areas of resolution. The purpose of the closed meeting is not to make a decision behind closed doors, but instead to determine the legal options for handling the referenced pending litigation. The only business to be discussed in this portion of the meeting is the pending litigation. That's pretty important. Um, an open session would be detrimental because it may take place in the presence of individuals involved in the pending litigation and a closed session would benefit the public because the ultimate outcome of the pending litigation may impact the finances and regulatory authority of the city. So. Now I would entertain a motion to close the portion of the meeting pursuant to um, statute 13D.05 subdivision 3B. Before that happens, yeah. um, we're, we're gonna be ending the recording for the closed session. And it's probably best if we don't try to start it up again and continue business after this. 
Yeah. So if there's any other business you wanted to try and conduct at this meeting, can we do that before you make a motion to close the meeting? Okay. I guess I was just assuming that we didn't have any any additional business. I, I'm hoping you don't, but I just wanted to make sure and ask just in case there was somebody who had something they wanted to mention. That's fair. Anyone? Kelly, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to ask, did you get a letter sent out to the county administrator and... Um, Oh, <laughs> and the engineer. Yes, we did send them a note um, right after the last meeting. They, I haven't heard back from them yet. I'll send them another note tomorrow. Okay. In the meantime, can we at least fill potholes? Is that something people are amenable to? Or what do people think? I think that's kind of been our practice for the last couple of years, hasn't it? Been just to go up and kind of spot fill um, when it gets real bad. Can we use uh, like tar or hot patch instead of gravel? Because I mean, I have no idea what that costs to go through there. And you know, obviously, we're not going to make it uh, smooth, but there's some that are about six inches deep and three feet across that will swallow right. the front of a car. So I don't know. Well, I, I would like to see at least at least gravel if it's not a huge problem. If we do have a source for for a hot patch, I do know that when we're hot patching holes like that, um, that does require a significant amount of labor to dig them out and to get them to a place where the hot patch will actually sit some on something. Um, so I, I I'm with I'm with I'm with Kelly. Let's I mean we just should just we just need to do something to get that road more serviceable. Um, in the meantime, so. If that's if the answer is hot patch and we spend a day out there um, preparing holes and filling them, then I'm cool with that. If that means put let's just put some gravel in it to until we hear back from the county, I think that that's workable as well. Not as not as good obviously, but workable. So does, it, does that work? Do we need a motion for it, or can we just direct them to do that? I I don't even know what you'd want to be in a specific motion. So I hear you. Yep. Okay. I think we'll talk to the street guys right. tomorrow and we'll figure something out. Okay. Thank you. And tell them thank you. We'll yep. do. Anything else? All right. Seeing seeing nothing. All right. So then let's uh I would entertain a motion to close the session pursuant to all the things I read before. <laughs> I make that motion. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? All right, so we're gonna do our roll call just like we did before. Uh, your vote, Anton? Aye. Kelly? Aye. Craig? Aye. Tim? Aye. And I am an I as well. So the motion carries. City Council will now go into a closed session. Uh, the time currently is, oh, what does it say on our stream? 8-12. All right, give me just a minute here, Jay. 8, yeah, 8, you can just say 8-12. Do I, I, I still have some more stuff. You can keep to reading. Through. Yeah. Um, cool. Only the officials and consultants of the city who reasonably require access to this data may be in attendance at any portion of the meeting for this agenda item. This portion of the meeting should not be taped or otherwise electronically recorded since it has been closed under attorney-client privilege. The minutes of this portion of the meeting should reflect only that a meeting was held, its time and location, who was present at the meeting, and the purpose of the meeting. Um, in addition to the city council, the following persons are present for the closed meeting. We have Mike Roth, he's a city administrator. We have Kim Dunsmore, the finance director. We have Chris Hood, city attorney. And I don't see Patrick on this. Is he gonna step out too? No, he'll be here. Okay, so maybe we should add him to that list. Patrick Knight, communications director. Um, so. Then you're good, Jay. We can, uh, yep. at this point, stop the tape, stop the video and have our closed session discussion. Okay. So that was. I now we're giving Patrick a minute. I was gathering that was the end of my my reading. I'm going to grab a little more water since Patrick's working on something. Okay. But I can hear you. <laughs> 